Yo, what's up, friends? It's me again. Thanks for listening. A unique show today because it's basically re-airing something that is housed already at the Bible Says What podcast. Host Michael Wiseman has set out with this podcast to basically grill pastors and other Christians about their Christian faith. And I'm not knocking Michael at all. I enjoy these conversations. I think they're fun. He is an atheist. And so basically all I can do, man, is say, this is what I think. This is how I feel. This is why I believe this. This is why I believe that. Because I'm sure not capable of being a spokesperson for the Christian faith. But we have some good dialogue and one sticking point during this conversation was the intense, sometimes violent things that Jesus himself said in the Gospels that are just kind of tricky. And so here's what's going to happen. I basically say, yeah, I don't really know, but there are some good explanations that smarter people can give you and that smarter person is Brian specifically one of them is Brian McLaren and so Brian McLaren author activist all around great guy someone who has influenced my faith a great deal he's coming on next week to deal with this exact thing giving us cultural context and more background on why Jesus seemed to have such a short fuse and pissed off a lot and threatening people and all of that sort of thing. It's something that has kind of tripped me up reading the words of Jesus, and Brian McLaren has been a great help for me to understand a little bit more of what's going on. So enjoy this conversation with Michael Wiseman on the Bible Says What podcast. You can find that podcast on iTunes. Before we do that, I do want to say that we are as Pastor With No Answers. We're on Instagram, and we would love to have you there. But here is what I would really like. We would love to share with the world. It's a little it's a little baby Instagram account. We just started it, but we would love to share with those followers some Pastor With No Answers listeners and give a little blip about you. That would be really fun. You can email pwnacontact at gmail.com to get more information. We'd love to do this weekly, honestly. And the Instagram account is at pwnapod. So I want to vent a little bit. There is a phrase that I personally would love to see removed from church culture, from church leadership, from church development studies, and all of that. I'd love, love, love to see it go. It's probably not going to go anytime soon, but I had a discussion about this very thing, and here's the phrase. Some of you that work in churches, you've heard it before, and it's this whole, if your church isn't growing, it isn't healthy, because healthy things grow. And here's the deal. The Chicago Bulls had some great teams in the 90s. Once the season started, I don't think that they added any players to their team. Maybe they did, but it wasn't a matter of, oh, they were healthy, so they just grew. It was actually someone adding someone to their team. But for the most part, the team just didn't naturally grow. They already had their basketball players. But guess what happened? They grew and grew and grew closer to each other. They gelled like crazy. They got better and better and better and really kicked some ass in the NBA. I think about my marriage. My wife and I, we've been together now since 2002, 18 years. We haven't added anybody to our marriage, but I sure hope that we are getting healthier and healthier or let's just take a house church maybe that has just committed to saying you know what let's have us 12 people hang out in fact that reminds me of the group of the the 12 apostles that jesus had he didn't keep adding to that number but i think they were growing as they hung out with jesus so my question is Why is numerical growth, why does that get to have kind of a monopoly on whether or not something is healthy? Can we just go ahead and get rid of this one? There are so many different ways 
in my opinion, that things can grow, that people can grow. And honestly, way more important facets of growth than numerical growth. So not only do I think this makes very little logical sense, but I also think that it just overlooks all sorts of different, like I've got four kids. We're not going to grow our number of kids at home, but I sure hope that they are growing as individual kids. That's my little soapbox. Every now and then I got to vent to you guys. I've already shared to you why. And I understand this phrase, but I, I don't really like it. But, you know, who cares what I like and what I don't like. But thanks for letting me vent. On to my friend from the Bible Says What podcast, Michael Wiseman. You guys enjoy the show, and we'll see you or we'll, we'll be in your ears next week with a very special episode with Brian McLaren that is kind of a follow-up to the one you're about to listen to. Love you all. From in the beginning to the musical apocalypse, this is The Bible Says What. I'm your host, Mike Wiseman. The ethnic cleansing of the Jewish people done by Hitler is undeniably disgusting and horrifying. From what I know of World War II, and I admit that I could be wrong, Hitler was attempting an ethnic cleansing rather than the termination of a belief structure. That being said, martyrs. Specifically, Christian martyrs. Why die for a belief in Christianity? Why not deny your belief in Yahweh with your words, but still believe in your head or heart? It just doesn't sound very rational to me. Why would someone not be willing to lie to save themselves? Pride? Fame? Some martyrs went down in history and are remembered and admired to this day. The Bible says in Revelation 2.10, Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Revelation 20 verse 4 says, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Die confessing your belief in Yahweh and you get to be a judge in heaven and have early access to Jesus. The loving Christian deity would rather watch someone suffer and die than have them deny their belief in him. Why would anyone want to worship such a monster? Let's start the show. Is there anything in the Bible that you yourself have an issue with? <laughs> A divine blast. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> I actually enjoyed arguing with you and stuff. God doesn't kill children. Does, what, what do you think the Passover was? Are you reading a different Bible? No. no. You worship him because of the things he's done. Why can I not judge him because of the things he's done? Obey me or I'll kill your kids. It doesn't seem very holy <laughs> well, to me. That's, yeah, that's, that's brutal, isn't it? Yeah. Oh man, what a tough life. Today we have Joey Svensson. From the pastors with no answer, pastor, I think it's singular, correct? Pastor. Yep, yep. Pastor with no answer. We'll we'll take on more pastors with no answers. We'll take on more. (laughs) (laughs) Bring it on. How you doing today? (laughs) Good, man. Good, good, good. I I was thinking about coming on this show just a little while ago, and I just want to go ahead and tell you my strategy is to annihilate all of your arguments with scriptures, because I... (laughs) have learned in the past that's the best way to talk to an atheist <laughs> do it. let's do it i'm excited man <laughs> totally joking around obviously so how's the podcast going good man good i'm actually really excited about lots of lots of guests coming up that are going to be super enjoyable uh get 
Science Mike coming on, honestly, to talk about the the virus, which I think he has some pretty interesting thoughts. And mm. a guy in the Christian hip hop world that recently came out of the closet, and then some some good old fashioned good old fashioned debates about spiritual things. And yeah, so I'm excited. Lots of lots of fun things coming up. It's it's one of the most pleasurable things that I do mm. for sure. Sounds like fun, man. Yep, yep, I'm sure you, I mean, you, you know where I'm coming from. I'm sure you have a lot of fun as well. I do, man, I do. I miss it sometimes. You yeah. Know, we don't get to do it yep. all the time. Gotcha. So what, gotcha. what flavor of uh, Christianity would you would you say you uh, subscribe to? Man, let's see. I think that I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I... Am around a lot of evangelicals, and yet I have had behind the scenes conversations with my lead pastor, the guy in charge, and he said he would probably consider himself not evangelical. So maybe I'm evangelical. I would say that theologically, belief wise, I lean more towards what I have found to be the ex- accepted beliefs in the ex-evangelical crowd, and yet I don't really like the actions of fundamentalist Christians nor the ex-evangelicals. It, it's almost like both, and the, the extreme manifestations of them, they have both become very dogmatic. You're either in or you're out, and you're out if you don't agree with absolutely everything that that we believe in and that just shuts down conversations and it, it honestly shuts down learning, you know, Mm -hmm. because if I, if I speak out and and say something that may be offensive to, let's say the ex evangelical crowd, but I'm, I'm, I'm honestly being sincere and someone basically shuts me down and says, you're a horrible person. We're never going to associate with you again, as opposed to, Hey, did you really just say that? Why, what did you mean by that? And helping me and instructing me and teaching me where I went wrong with what I said. It's, it's just crazy. Like it's, it's almost like the, the cancel culture. I just, I just learned that terminology, by the way, is, is alive and awake, man. And it's, it shuts down learning for sure. So you're more of a, you just kind of go along with what you learn and what you, you, you think to be true as you go along with your Christianity. Yeah. You're, 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 so so I, I don't know what I would call myself, but I would say that I follow the teachings of Jesus. And here's what I would say that my beliefs are based on. First, it's based on the fact that I think the most sensible explanation for the universe is a creator. I, I find, and, and this is my very novice scientific approach, like I'm not a scientist, I, I don't consider myself super educated with science, but it seems like either the universe was eternal or the universe came out of nothing, or there was a higher power that was eternal. And for me, out of those three, the one that makes the most sense is a higher power that was eternal. I, like, it seems like there's got to be some something smarter than us that, that, that did stuff that we can't really grasp as opposed to an eternal universe. That just doesn't make any sense. And then, obviously, if there was ever nothing, then there would not be anything right now. So I definitely don't believe in, like, a Big Bang sort of deal. So that's the first thing, is I I, I certainly can't see a better explanation for the universe than a, a higher power. Second, the second deal would be hmm. there seems to me enough evidence that, this Jesus guy actually did what he said and rose from the dead. I've studied a lot. I know both viewpoints and I side with the viewpoint of, yeah, I think that dude rose from the dead. And so I'm listening to him I'm trying to learn from him. Hmm. And then the, the third thing is I would say experience and what I have found to be things that have happened in my relationship with God. Now, I also am not like a lot of Christians who would say, I know for certain that I have felt God and have heard God. (laughs) I would say I believe with all my heart, and yet I could also be wrong. But Hmm. it is so real to me that I don't really think along the lines of whether or not um, 
Did that noise come to you too? No. Okay. I just heard something weird. I didn't know if it was on my end, but yeah, I just, I, I feel, I, I feel like the experiences that I have had, they're just undeniable. And undeniable so as in it, being Jesus? Undeniable as far as being real to me. And given that all of my life has been basically pursuing God through the lenses of Jesus and his teachings, I don't know what else I would I would call it. Gotcha. So you just because you were brought up in it, I think that's where we, that's exactly where we ended last time was the whole uh, you've you've picked your idea of how the world works and I've picked my idea. It's just picking and choosing. You grew up in it and you've chosen this. I grew up in it and I chose not to believe it. Picking and choosing. But right. yeah, I mean, I, I understand that it's, it's the universe is complicated. Science is complicated. I don't understand a lot of it either. Um, but I don't automatically assume that it's Jesus. You know, I don't automatically go to Jesus right off the bat. Uh, even though I've had a lot of history with this this particular um, demigod, uh, I don't right. I don't follow it as a, a real thing. You do, and that's just sure. where we draw the sure. line there. So, but I would say that oh. it's it's not just picking and choosing as much as you have also asked the tough questions, hmm. and you have heard probably smart teachers, and you have ended up where you have ended up and I have done the same thing and I have ended up where, where I've ended up. And so I don't see it as by any means as me just going on a hunch. Like I feel like, yeah, not so much, hunch, but you know, you, you feel this, you, you, you've experienced these things, but instead of attributing it to my invisible dinosaur deity, you attribute it to Jesus. Oh, here goes the invisible yeah. dinosaur. Thing. <laughs> See, you don't you don't know though. You said you you, you uh, like those people that um, what did you say uh, felt God. You don't know if you've actually felt God. You don't know for sure, right? Is that what, what you were saying? Yeah, I would I, I would say that, but mm. I that that to me when I say that mm. I am I am speaking logic and science. Because I cannot prove to myself or anyone else that what I heard was from God, I think it is the only honest thing for me to say is I could be wrong. However, in my heart of hearts, hmm. of course I believe, or else I wouldn't be surrendering my whole life to this higher power. I have had times in which I have been out of nowhere just so consumed with an unbelievable love and comfort and just completely taken me by surprise. And it didn't have anything to do with a hug from my wife or a s sex with my wife or being with best friends and relishing in memories. We're talking by myself out of nowhere. I don't know how to, how to explain that. And then I was, was actually telling my feeling, Go ahead. a feeling came out of nowhere. Sure. A feeling, but for me, it is, it's, I, that's not how I would describe it to someone else. I would describe it. How would it you as describe it? Yeah. God. God. I mean, okay, so <laughs> describe this feeling, this experience. Describe it. I, I just did. Just an overwhelming sense of presence outside of me that think... made me feel overwhelmed by grace and overwhelmed by its his, hers acceptance of me. And to, to the point where in that moment, I feel like, what do I ever worry about? Why do I ever trouble myself and, and stress out about things? So you feel Why do I relax? lose sight of what's most important? I mean, it's, it's just simply overwhelming. So, and so I, I think, too, what we discussed last time as well is, hmm. I know for a fact that I can't prove this to you. Yeah. I, mean, I just so, wanna, I, so, I, so it feels like you're relaxed, like it's relaxing, it's calming, it's it's a it's a peaceful feeling, is what you're saying. Uh, I, I I would relax, sure, but for me it it's it's like uh in in the in the most positive terms, abrasive. It's like holy shit, what was that? Oh my gosh! I don't, I don't know. And I can't. And, I can't uh, no, I know. I'm not there with you. I know, but that, but but that's that's the thing is if 
if there is a God, I would imagine he would interact with, with people that only the individual recognizes. Like, <clears throat> if I am right, mm-hmm. how cool is that, that God interacts with me in a specific, unique way? An invisible way where you it, don't know if it's him, though. That's, that's not really that unique. It's, it's mysterious for no reason. He has the power right, to show I, himself there or say, hey, psst, it's me, you know, anything. But instead, he gives you this weird feeling of grace and embrace, and that's it, and just leaves you with that. And you have no idea if it's him or my invisible dinosaur deity. Right, right. But, right. but what, you're missing, what you're missing is, I feel, and again, this mm. is feelings, this uh-huh. is not proof. <laughs> I feel when what I just described, when it happens... To me, God is clearly saying, this is me, you're okay, I've got you covered. So you 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 say from an outside perspective that, yeah, you just have a feeling and why isn't God just proving it more? I'm saying what I experienced is God doing that very thing. Yeah, but you can't prove it's him and you don't know for sure it's him. Heart of hearts. What's a heart of hearts, by the way? What's that? What is a heart of hearts? You know, you mean when someone says in his heart of hearts? Yeah. What do you mean by heart of hearts? Did I say that? Yeah. Oh, cool. No, I, I like that <laughs> thing. I think it's I think it's just figurative for in the depths of your heart. That's funny that I said that and didn't even realize it. <laughs> I wrote it down. In my like, heart of hearts. What is that anyways? You never heard that before? I've heard it a couple of times, but like it just it's a weird thing to say in my heart of hearts. <laughs> like it's your heart inside of your heart. Or, I don't know. I don't know. I think yeah, too I would much say, into these things, I, would, I think. Sure. I would say maybe a more sensible way of putting it would be in, in, the, in my depths. In like depths the of depths heart. of my soul. <laughs> soul and heart being synonymous. Words. And I, it's it's interesting because I was talking to a couple of my friends, honestly, people uh, way further down the life journey than me, people mm. that I look up to, ask for advice and everything, and, and actually released uh, a conversation that I had with them on my podcast, Pastor With No Answers. And one of them basically takes the approach of, faith really is faith. Like we, we just can't know and we can feel like we're sure to ourselves, but we cannot know the other, the other pastor. One's a pastor, one's not. So the pastor actually thinks, no, we can know, like we, we, we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I, I disagree with mm. the latter. And I even said, I feel closer and more secure with God when I am operating in a Lord, I believe but help me with my unbelief sort of mentality. And I don't know if that's because I came with such baggage in my childhood, as far as being deathly afraid every time I doubted, like whether it's going to cost me my soul, Hmm. that may be part of it, but I really have enjoyed this, this last season, like the last five years or so of basically being okay with, not being sure, and at the same time, in my heart of hearts, being sure. <laughs> mm. And and I and I honestly think it's very dishonest for for Christians to not acknowledge that we potentially. I mean, you put a number on it: one percent, point five, point five percent, twenty percent. There is a possibility that we are all completely deceived. That it, that has to be on the table, or else it's not faith. Right. Well, faith. So it's, it's, to me, it seems like you're just pretending. That's what faith is to you, is you're just going to pretend this is all real. And when you're pretending, it feels real because you're pretending. It's kind of like when an actor goes on the studio and they've got a really incredible set, uh, set and it really feels like they're in the 40s or something. You, 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 you just pretend. You just you use this faith as... Just a different way of saying it. It's make believe for adults. I mean, you don't know for sure. You don't know any of this is positive. You don't. You don't have a, a definitive proof. But you know what? I'm gonna. I'm just gonna believe it anyways. I'm gonna hold on to that belief. And that's what makes me happy. That pretending. You know, it's larping for older kids. I don't know. So <laughs> it's just weird. So it, and 
and nothing, I think I told you this last time too, there's, I don't think there's anything you're going to say that's going to get me rattled as far as anger. So right. any yeah. of this sounds like I'm offended, I, I'm not at all, but it seems I that you don't all... mean to offend. Actually, absolutely not. Uh, it's just no, how sure. I feel about it for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it feels like you are minimizing how real those experiences are for me. Now here, here's, here's what I think would be a little more fair for you to say. Hmm. Okay. You may not be pretending you are very convinced because of something that you experienced that felt so real. Joey, I believe that it's wrong, but I can also acknowledge that for some reason it was so real for you. You do believe Hmm. like that to me would be a little more, fair on your part because it seems as if, and I, I think Christians are notorious for talking to someone like they're dumb or uninformed, but it, it sounds like you are basically saying, Joey, you're a stupid idiot and you're relying <laughs> on experiences. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and I, and I'm saying, it's just weird for me. Are real to me. Right. They're it's just real. weird for me standing on the outside of never having sure. one of these, you know, experiences. And then even if sure. I did, it's like when my favorite song comes on, you know, you get all excited about it and you're singing and stuff <laughs> like that. You know, that's the kind of feeling, you know, or when you're about to see a movie you've been waiting forever and the title comes on, you know, da da, you know, you get all excited, stuff like that. Yeah. That's the way I yeah. attribute the, the these feelings to. Um no right. no deity and, and needed. Just, sure. And just for just for discussion's sake, again, the feeling that I described hmm. is not me listening to a yeah, yeah. spiritual song. It's not me seeing a movie that moves me. It is, it is none of the above. If anything, I think, and, and I'm, I'm talking these, this, this sort of experience that I'm describing has happened in my most doubt filled seasons in which I was scared to death. Like, I don't know if I still believe, or I don't know if I'm on a pathway of not believing. And if I don't believe, what does that mean? Because I've lived my whole life believing there is is God and there's meaning through that and everything. And in those moments, there's been times where it's almost like my consciousness is like, so what do you have to say about that God? And that is the response is, an overwhelming sense of peace, love, acceptance, grace. And, and, and here's the thing too, for me, and again, I know that from your perspective, it's like, well, I don't understand that. You can't prove it. And and I I get (laughs) and appreciate and respect your point of view, but I also have other friends. For example, there's Dan Koch. He has a podcast called you have permission and Hmm. he is probably not probably he is definitely more progressive in his beliefs. And I've heard him say the same sort of thing that to him, it is undeniable that he has experienced God. And so Mm -hmm. that also to me fuels the fire and Mm -hmm. maybe it's a fake fire. Maybe it's a real fire. But, but for me, when I hear other people that have had similar experiences, people, people honestly that are, are comfortable with walking away. Like, I don't feel like I even have that because I, I definitely was brought up in some pretty unhealthy religious circles. And so I wouldn't be comfortable even saying I don't believe anymore and walking away. I'd be too afraid to do that maybe, but thank goodness hmm. that I'm, I'm not, I'm not in this just because of fear. I'm in this because I really feel like I've experienced God. And again, I, I, I say the history speaks pretty loudly in the high probability of someone that was on earth named Jesus who died and rose from the dead. Like I, I, I understand the counter arguments, but for me, the arguments are definitely overwhelmingly strong enough for me to believe in that. So, and so that's a huge, huge component of my faith. So do you use the Bible to confirm these or do you, um, what other sources do you use? Uh, well, for me, I, I actually went through, uh, I'll I'll sound like a a bragger. Like I went through a, (laughs) um, it was not, I always forget the word. What, what's the word I'm looking for when an education isn't accepted in this country? It's not, uh, gosh, Mm. what the heck is that word? It's, so basically, I have a seminary degree that hmm. is not. All the listeners are are saying the word. Yeah. <laughs> I can hear them. I can hear them already. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 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 
not uh, accepted in, a, in America, but for me, that wasn't the point. I didn't need a master's degree. I actually wanted to do it for my education. And I, so, yes, I have read many things outside of the Bible. I, I, I actually do not believe in, I've, I've actually heard some pretty silly teachings and someone saying, I believe the Bible because the Bible tells us to believe in the Bible. I'm like, what the <laughs> hell did you just say? <laughs> I, and, and so I don't see things that way. I've, I've yeah. heard, I've read, I've, I understand that there are some, in my opinion, very impartial historians who have written about Jesus and not even in the, not even in a way of, he must be the Messiah, but in a, there's something pretty strange and crazy going on right now. Hmm. And, to, you know, for me, and there, I, I also don't want to lay aside the Bible as completely unhistorical because I, I think there's enough proof for the existence of the Apostle Paul. And he wrote a letter, I think, to the Corinthians in which, so these letters are being circulated in in, in real time. And so people are reading these letters and he basically says, I think somewhere where 500 disciples were, were baptized. Well, at the time, hmm. if he was lying about that, there would be enough people to read that letter and say, that's bullshit. That, that, that never happened. Hmm. But th those letters were embraced to such a, a degree that we're still reading them now. And mm -hmm. obviously that's not going to happen if someone is completely lying. And then someone could say, yeah, but what if, what if Paul got together with a bunch yeah. of people and made up this huge lie? Well, it's still not going to go anywhere. It's not going to go anywhere because at some point you find multitudes of people that are like, Oh shit. And after a hundred years, those people die out and it's done. Is, is done. There's, there's no more continuing that lie. Hmm. So for me, know. that sort of historical stuff, it would have been snuffed out a long time ago. Yeah, long there's time a lot ago. of stories about crazy things happening with people that have passed down longer than Jesus. Um, you've got all these old stories of old gods, for instance. You know, they're still being passed around. Still, people believe a lot of this crazy stuff. So, I mean, technically, just because it passed down and survived doesn't mean, I don't know. So, I don't, I don't find that as a, as a, a viable reason to believe it. Sure, sure. Um, so, without the Bible, would you still believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Would you have enough evidence? Well, that's a tough, that's a tough question for me to answer because everything for me started with the Bible. That's kind of like the central thing working here. And hmm. I, I do believe that the Bible reveals a lot of truth. I would say I would have a hard, I would have a hard time believing if the Bible was it. Like if I said, Hey, is there anybody, is there any other historian talking about this stuff or mentioning Jesus or anything? And everybody was like, Nope, everything is just in the Bible. So just believe that. I'd be like, ooh, I don't like a lot of people. That, that doesn't feel too good. So I mean, it would be hard people for People believed crazy believe. things back then, just like people believe crazy things like now. Say that again, I'm sorry? People believed crazy things back then, just like people believe crazy things now. Like this, like Jesus rose from the dead. That's a pretty crazy thing. So people believed it. Someone told somebody else they believed it. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh-huh. Then my cousin, too, you know, and all that stuff. And it just keeps going. People believe crazy sure. things. Sure. So I don't sure, know how but, passing it along doesn't mean yeah, it's but accurate. I, I feel like you can't get away with just saying that because historically there were people that despite knowing they were going to be tortured and killed, they still continue to That happens in every religion. Message. That happens, that, it in, happens every in every religion. Every, yeah, it happens with like, you know, Dave Koresh and basically convincing all of his believers to, to you know, kill themselves. But so that doesn't we're make talking, it true. This, Exactly, but we're talking this Jesus guy. He's gone. He done. He done ascended. So they don't have that person influencing them, saying, "Better die for me." They are basically so convinced of what they have seen and heard to where. I mean, to me, that just doesn't make sense. So Jesus is gone. They're not it doesn't in his make presence sense to, anymore. To die for a crazy belief like that, it doesn't make sense at all. Just deny it and keep going and believe it in your head. Don't die for it. That doesn't make any sense. 
Yeah, I I understand that, and and honestly, that doesn't sound I like have... a sane thing to do to begin with. I mean, you got to question that person's mental abilities. I'm going to die oh, for something. I, I can just that. automatically say, you know, I don't believe that, and walk off and actually believe it. You just told the guy a lie, not a big deal. You you move on with your life. But no, these people well, want to die for this. They want to be martyred for some reason. Well, if if you take that to its furthest degree, then everyone should have been draft dodgers, and everyone should stay clear <laughs> of the military. I mean, that's a whole everybody other conversation. Say, <laughs> well, I mean, seriously, everybody could say I I don't believe in anything that that America has done in the past, present, future, um, or I do believe I do support what they were trying to do with World War II, but I'm not going to tell anybody, and I'm surely not going to be a part of that. I mean, I, so, but to be to be honest, I have thought before that in 2020. If someone came into my house somehow, I like the whole came into your house analogy, but if someone came into my house and pointed a gun to my head and said, denounce Jesus or I will kill your kids, I, I would, in, in my head, I would say, Lord, I love you and you know how I feel about you, but I feel like I, I would probably denounce just to save my kids because at the end of the day, and I know that will rub a lot of Christians the wrong way, but at the end of the day, does God want my kids to die just because I utter something from my mouth or is he fine with actually seeing my heart? And I could be wrong there. I could be wrong. Hmm. Maybe God, maybe that, maybe I would do that. And then eventually be in heaven. God was like, why, why didn't you speak up for me, man? You, you, you know how, short life is and how, you know, and what kind of a testimony would that have been to those people that were about to kill you? But I, I don't know what I would do in that situation, but I'm kind of leaning towards, I would lie. And yeah. Say, yeah. Just makes sense. That way. So yeah. you, you mentioned that Jesus uh, floated into the clouds or rose and rose up, rose into the clouds or floated away or whatever it was you said. Yeah. Do, do, yeah. I believe that. So you believe that part. Um, how do you believe all the stories of Jesus in there or do you just some of them or how, how does that work for you? The stories of Jesus. So like the, the things the, about Jesus in the gospels. What? Yeah. Right. What the Bible says about Jesus. Do you believe those things to be true? All of it or just some of it? Well, I believe that the intent of the author, as far as what they are originally trying to get out there is is true but but honestly let me retract that because that doesn't really make sense here's what i'll say about the gospels they were intended to be historical record of what happened so by and large yes i don't think that there's any story about jesus that i'm like "Eh, i don't believe that however I don't need all the tiny little details to line up amongst Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I don't think that's a sensible thing. I don't think it is a a reasonable thing to expect because I know how things work in this earth. And if you have four different people seeing something, they're going to see it from four different perspectives. They may get a detail here or a detail there wrong. And I think a lot of Christians trip up because they're like, well, my gosh, if, if one little detail is wrong, well, you know, what, what else is wrong? But I don't think those sorts of things are important. But yeah, I believe, I believe all the stuff about Jesus for sure. So do you believe it gives you an accurate uh, description of the character of Jesus? His, his character, not the character, but his character. Yes, but I would say that reading something that was originally written in Greek and Aramaic and in a culture 2,000 years ago and in a very specific place on the earth, I think that I have to be careful to not assume I know what Jesus is getting at with certain things. For example, I spoke to a friend of mine, he's an author, and I asked him, I said, you know, Jesus sounds pretty pissed off, and he sounds like he's really pointing the finger and almost proclaiming judgment and violence on people, and that seems mm-hmm. to be so contradictory with how he actually interacted with them. And well, those he, stories that there's there's definitely stories that he's nice, and there's definitely stories where he's mean. So how yeah. do you decipher between the 
the five or six stories he's mean and the five or six stories where he's nice. How do you decipher well, what's I mean, real? I... So you're going to take the nice one because you like nice Jesus. You don't like the, the I come to bring a sword Jesus who's going to punish non-believers for eternity. You don't like that Jesus. So you, you stick oh, with the nice see, Jesus. That's what... So that's what I'm saying. But you're... You're putting me in a Christian box that I'm not in, though. So let me let me say, let me say this. First of all, I I know where you're coming from with nice Jesus and mean Jesus, but right. I, I I I say loving Jesus and <laughs> the stuff that don't seem loving, I will assume that I don't know what he's talking about, and that has been proven right. So, for example, the author told me, you know, when Jesus is talking about a day of judgment, uh-huh. when people said a day of judgment two thousand years ago, they're talking about war. I mean, they are talking about war. So it's very and, clearly saying that Jesus is going to come back and punish people. They're going to, and then Yahweh's wrath. It's got all of that's in there. It doesn't say anything about judgment as as war. Which verse specifically do you do you see the whole judgment as being war? When when Jesus says it'll in, in, in day of judgment. That's what I'm saying. That's it. My whole it life, doesn't say I war though. You have to like add right. that word war. And, Right, but you're doing exactly what I just said that I think we need to be hesitant of is these 2020 American, hmm. you know, citizens reading something that is so ancient and assuming that we know exactly and that right, that like the whole resurrection translated and... to English. Right. Oh, well. So, so we'll take the resurrection, the craziest part of the story, and we'll believe that part. But the part where he's going to come back and punish people, we won't take that part because translational errors. No, I think that the resurrection is something that would not be able to stand on just a literature foundation. And I think that the resurrection is something that had to have stood on the shoulders of people who witnessed it. And I, you know, I'm just I'm telling you that <laughs> I'm going to do a, a whole a whole episode on. Jesus and what he said and what he meant, because I actually had a really hard time with, because I, I, I definitely, I'll say for sure I'm a hopeful universalist, but I would say that I even lean a little more towards that, which means you, sir, are going to be in the presence of Jesus and you're going to be so happy and so excited and you're going to be like, man, this is awesome. I'm so glad that I was wrong. I do, I do, I do lean towards that. Um, so it's, it's, it's nicer. It's a nicer that, thing, you know. It, it's a lot nicer than Jesus with the sword and the punishment and you know eternal hellfire and whatnot. It, it, you've chosen the nicer, pleasant story. Sure, but I, it's it's based on and and my it, where I'm coming from. It's based on the character of God. So let me let me say. So this. where do you so get the idea of the some, character of God? Well, well, Jesus said that when you see me, you see the Father. And what, what is the, here's the main driving threshold of hmm. what Jesus said, and everything revolved around it. And that's clear. That is very clear. And that is love other people. Love your enemies. Love, hmm. love, 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 love. love and love. so you mean to tell me that Jesus wants us to love our enemies? But Jesus and the Father are going to torture their soul. Like, that absolutely makes no sense. And so I spent a very long time just accepting all those very scary, scary stuff about God because I felt, well, that's just what the Bible says, and mm-hmm. I, I believe, and I just accept it. Well, now I'm at a place to where, wait a second, a lot of this stuff just doesn't make sense of the, the character of God. And on top of that, there are very, very smart men, way smarter than me, such as Richard Rohr and everything he says I don't agree with, uh, Brian McLean and everything he says I don't believe with. But these are, these are dudes that are way more studied than me, know the Bible way more, know the history and culture way more. And they do believe that Jesus will save everyone. So it's what not are they saving based on him just, from, though, if not hellfire, from death, just death. We're so from those death. who don't believe are just going to die, and then the the people that do believe get to spend eternity with shiny, happy Jesus. No, I'm saying that everyone gets to spend eternity with 
Jesus and okay. paradise, which, well, not, not paradise. Like, I believe there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and all the good things that you get to experience now with earth, like friendships and entertainment and art and beauty and creation and all of that stuff, you're going to be able to experience that forever, but without the heartache, without the stress, without the hatred, without the uh, unforgiveness, without death. Is, so I'm going to be forced, right forced to spend eternity with Jesus. I don't have a choice. No, no. I, I believe that when you stand, and, and I, I just just for the record, if you have a lot of atheists listening, I, I recognize that a lot of this is like, good Lord, he's living in la-la land. But you know what? <laughs> I really do believe this. So I, <laughs> a nice I, believe, <laughs> I believe that you will stand before the throne of God and you will be so overwhelmed with love and uh-huh. so captivated by how in the world can I be this loved and recognize that this entity is the one that created me, knows me more than, than, than I know myself. You're not going to be forced. You're going to be like, I am so glad that I am loved. Uh, so I don't think of it at all as you're going to be forced. You're, you're going to voluntarily decide that. So, so where are you getting the idea that I'm going to be standing in front of him with being, you know, Care Bear Stare style love just thrown at me? How, how, where do you get that idea from? Where's that concept come from? thrown at you no i believe that right now it is it is existing now but how things are set up we don't we're not able to receive it in its fullness it's not thrown at you you're gonna be in the presence of god where are you getting this idea though that the presence of god is an overwhelming sense of love i i told you this is what i think right but where are you getting that from though like where's this idea this concept come from um i don't I guess I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know what you're saying. I I believe that. Why do you I, believe I mean, that? Okay, well, I'll go back to the beginning of the conversation, in which I definitely believe the most plausible explanation for the creation. No, not of that. No, 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 no. Why do you, Why do you believe that the presence of God is an overwhelming sense of love? Why do you believe that concept? Because of. Because of the history of people who interacted with Jesus and basically surrendered to torture, Mm -hmm. uh, because of, again, the history of Jesus dying and raising from the dead and that being a very real thing that sure some people could say it never happened, but there's, you gotta, you gotta ignore or put to rest a, a, a lot of evidence in the, in the camp of it did happen. And, and so now I'm looking at the teachings of Jesus and what he says. And I believe that Some of it. if, if, if God is love, then it transcends what I can even understand. Right. You have to take out parts that he's not loving the parts where he's not loving. You have to take those parts out in order for your loving concept to fit. It, it, that's well, what, what I'm seeing here. What part? Well, like Jesus comes back with a sword to punish non-believers. That there's one part. Uh, to, Jesus to punish says, to punish non-believers. That's what it says. I see, Luke. Uh, I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have to. Uh, I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but division. That's Luke. Uh, 12, 49 through 51, uh, kind of diva-like, he's going to bring fire to the earth. Uh, Matthew 10, 34, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth, but I have not come to bring peace, but a sword, for I have come to turn a man against his father, uh, mother against his blah, blah, blah. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, this will happen when our Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire and his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction. Jesus will be doing this punishing, uh, according to 1, 7. So that's where sure. I'm getting it from, the Bible. Well, uh, so. yeah, well, a few things. First of all, do you do you think that that evil is going to be completely extinguished 
by just waving a, a peace flag, or do you think it is something that will have evil. to be taken by force? I think creating evil was probably a bad idea to begin with. And then, yeah. according to Revelations, not only does he create the evil, but he releases it on purpose to be set upon the earth. On purpose. According to what? Just a Revelation. It's in Revelation. I can't just remember the verse exactly right this second, but I'll look it up. Anyways, so it is in Revelation. He 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 uh, he releases the serpent, the dragon, Satan, upon the earth for a thousand years. Why? So at the end of it, he can show off his powers by stopping him at the last minute before he destroys his favorite city. It's a it's a pointless drama. It, it and that's what's in the Bible. That's what the the Bible says. Yeah, I mean, once again, you're assuming that you like. So here's an example. Did you know that when Jesus talks about fire and judgment and all of that. That culture had no concept of hell. It wasn't even in their radar. All through the Old Testament leading up to Jesus, hell was not on the table. It was not something that people feared. It was not something that people even had a concept of. So now what you're doing is you're telling me that when Jesus says these sorts of things, the people are hearing it as, oh, Burning forever. Yeah, man. Whereas, 1342 what? talks about a fiery furnace with weeping and mashing, gnashing of teeth. Uh, Matthew 25 talks about an eternal punishment. So yeah, these people had it there. At least the, the authors of these books did. They were talking about yeah, it. Have you, have you Yahweh is in hell destroying Anna? bodies and souls. That's Matthew 1028. Yahweh is in hell destroying bodies and souls. Matthew 1028. Matthew 828. 8, Yahweh is in hell destroying people's souls. 10. 10, 10, 28. Matthew 10, 28. That's a great verse. I love that one. Matthew. Let's go to that right now. That's a fun one. <clears throat> do not be afraid. Let's go 28. Uh, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but not, cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Well, who can destroy both soul and body? Yahweh. I mean, that that sounds a lot different than what you just said. Who's in hell destroying bodies and souls? Who? This doesn't say that God is in hell. It's be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Who has the power to destroy both soul and body? Yeah, but... I mean, there's a lot of things going on here. First of all, do you, do you know how, and, and I'm definitely getting into some territory that's over my head here, but do you know <laughs> that the word hell is, is likely translated to Gehenna, which was an actual burning dump back then that people put their waste and, and burnt it again? So, so when Jesus hell was, talking was an about actual it, thing, it was an actual place full of fire. So they right. did believe so, in the hell. Hmm, I, I wonder what Jesus is talking about. I'm scratching my head just like I scratch my head when he's saying all these other parables that I don't understand what the hell he's talking about. So hmm. I'm just saying that you have to be super careful. Like I, I personally believe that a lot of doctrine has been firmly situated in place incorrectly because we have approached the Bible in a way that we assume as 20th century, now 21st century uh, Americans, we can actually understand what's going on here. And as far as bringing a sword and uh, um, coming to for division and all of that, I, I believe for certain that if you preach unconditional love and forgiveness, there will be division because some people do not want to live in that way. Christians what included. For, then? Some, what's that? What's the sword for then? Well, he came to bring all, a sword. Well, oh, this one I'm afraid to say is, is definitely figurative. The sword is, <laughs> is talked about constantly as the, as God's word. Well, that's an interesting way to interpret it. Sure, you know. sure. I do. I do believe that the ways of this world will be stopped, and potentially, in some 
sort of violent way. I don't see, I don't see, I don't see how evil as, as destructive and as far reaching as it is that, I mean, I, I guess if God wanted to, he could just snap his finger and end it all, or it could be something that is forcefully done, or we're reading this stuff and we, we don't know exactly what Jesus's intentions are. And I definitely Hmm. want, uh, I will, I will reach out to you when the episode drops with Brian McLaren, because a lot of this stuff, like I said, is, is over my head and I understand your points, but I just had one conversation with him for about an hour on the phone and realized, Oh my gosh, there's so much about this culture and the things they're talking about that I had no idea of. But I was basically told as a kid, put the Bible in your hand, read stuff, believe stuff. And that's not necessarily the the wisest thing, because I also wasn't taught. Remember now, this is a different world, a different culture, a different time, a different place. And, Hmm. uh, you know, I'll give you I'll give you an example. And I may be regurgitating some stuff that I said from the last time I talked to you. But (laughs) I'm sure you and I. (laughs) Yeah. You and I both know that if someone in America says once upon a time in a land far, far away, you and I both know, oh, fictional story. Hmm. Okay, well, we know that just because we know that it's a part of our culture. It's, it's, but there is nothing in that phrase that says this is fiction. It says once upon a time in a land far, far away. So if we take that literally, it's like, oh, okay. So there was a time and a place really far away. Okay, tell me more of this truth. But you and I know that's not to be the case. I mean, that is one In basic the beginning. example. Uh, that's <laughs> one basic example of how language, we have to respect the fact that we're reading stuff from 2,000 years ago. Or, or how about just the simple terminology, mm. how about? That's a weird combination for words, but you and I <laughs> both know what it means if someone says, how about we go get some pizza. How about that's weird, but you and I understand exactly what that means because we are in this culture. I just think we need to be careful. I, I, I totally agree. I mean, let's not just jump onto the first crazy thing. Somebody says, totally agree with you. So you've picked, uh, again, we are back to the picking and choosing. You've picked the shiny, happy Jesus, as opposed to the angry, wrathful, vengeful uh, hellfire Jesus, which, well, and and Yahweh as well, apparently same thing, same concept. You've got well, the shiny, happy I, Yahweh. Yeah, I actually, I'm not your stereotypical Christian when it comes to Old Testament wrath and and all that stuff. So that would be a different area to discuss. But yeah, so do you believe think, that Yahweh is all powerful? Yeah, I do. I do. And, but and, I'm also I'm I'm actually open to what you would call open theology, which is something that guys like Greg Gregory Boyd and Thomas Ord believe, and that is that because God doesn't fully know everything in the future, and it's not because he's limited in power, it's because the future is unknowable, and because God can't know the future because he gave people true free will, there are some things that happen that he wishes didn't happen. I understand that theology so, and I'm, yeah. I'm open to it, but that's probably not where I'm at. Okay. So you're not, okay. So, so you do believe he's all powerful. I do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you get that concept from the Bible, correct? Or is that just putting things together and, and coming up with that conclusion? Uh, I mean, I would say philosophic, philosophically, if there <laughs> is a creator of the universe, then I'm going to assume he made everything and the universe is way bigger than what my mind can grasp. Uh, hmm. He's probably all powerful. Hmm. So, so, hmm. so what parts, I'm just trying to get what parts of the Bible you, you, you decipher as, um, do, do you think he wants to keep you from harm? Um, yeah, but when I when I think of that, I think of more e- eternal harm as well as a renewed mind. Like I, I don't think that there is any way that I'm going to walk through this whole earth. Like you know, I a lot of my listeners know that I went through a immensely tough 
season last year, most specifically September and October of deep, 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 dark depression. So I don't think that we're going to avoid different obstacles and horrible trials and and all of that. But I do believe that God's greatest intent for us is to be whole forever in his hands. It's quite an interesting concept you got. Yeah, you like that? So, for (laughs) example, for example, there is a, there's a guy named Pete Enns and he's, he's another, he's another Christian that a lot of people would call a heretic, but he says that in those stories where the Israelites said, God told us to slaughter all the men and all the women and all the Mm -hmm. children. He said, the Israelites are telling their story. What that means is I don't, I don't, I can speak for myself that there are definitely times in which I thought that I heard from God and I definitely did not. So for me, it is not out of the question for, they didn't hear right from God, just, just like Christians in the 1950s didn't hear right from God when they didn't believe that black people should share the same restrooms. I mean, that's a despicable racist Uh. approach to life. Well, the Bible and a actually lot promotes them, actually, slavery, though. The Bible itself is is, is pro slavery. Love the Lord your uh, God. I mean, is, is, yeah, yeah is but obey you, the Lord you're, as you're, your slaves obey their masters. I mean, yeah, but you're I, making a huge jump again from that history and what that meant back then ooh, to what it's, it's still right slavery, now. man. It's still somebody being owned as property, and it's not a good thing. And Yahweh, being an all-powerful, smart dude, should have known that throughout history this would be used against people. This would be used to hurt people. Well, you do know historically how slavery ended, right? Yeah, it wars was, and it, whatnot, it was, and we stopped it. It, it was a, the, a major influence of radical Christians, most of them nonconformist to the institutional manifestation of of church i mean that that was at the forefront of slavery being put still it was being used by christians to support slavery regardless of the separate christians that were trying to stop it so what was used what was used what are you saying the bible the bible and these verses that to to own slaves and, and even gives you instructions on how to own a slave and what to do with them um these these bible verses yeah, but, were used as you all know, right so, proof all right, so let's say I visit another country and slavery is a very accepted thing, and doesn't everyone make it, right, though. Th- I, it doesn't make it right. But do I have the best bet of infiltrating that village and having influence by saying this is wrong, this shouldn't be done, stop it, stop it, stop it, or? Could I maybe teach radical love between a slave and a slave owner, encourage that? He came and down and said no where shellfish. That, where you don't that think leads. he can come down and say no slavery? No shellfish. You can't do this. You can't do that. I mean, there's a ton of things. You can't even mix mix colors, for crying out loud. But he can't tell you to, to not beat your slave? I mean, that just seems weird to me. I mean, you don't think that... What, what do you think Paul was saying when he said there's no male, female, there's no Greek, Jew, there's no slave or free? Yeah. I well, mean, that, that right there was some radical stuff, putting everyone on an equal playing field. That's some crazy, crazy stuff. So the rich person and the slave. That doesn't counter none of that all the other things in there, though. That doesn't erase them. That doesn't make them any less horrible. Yeah. I mean, you know, and you were saying that 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 the Israelites got it wrong. They heard they heard wrong from Yahweh when they went in and killed uh, women and children. And, and I'm saying there's for crying out loud. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I believe. so in, in Hosea nine, when it's supposed to be Yahweh speaking, when he goes down to the people of Ephraim and kills their children, starves them to death, aborts their fetuses, uh, he says, "I will slay your cherished offspring." This is Yahweh talking. Do you think they wrote that down wrong, or was it actually Yahweh doing this? So it says, say that again. 
Uh, it's Hosea 9, let's just go 11 through 17. Uh, specifically, number 16 says, I will slay your cherished offspring. This is Yahweh angry at people of Ephraim because they worshipped a different deity. So he's going to go in and kill their children. And, and I've heard the argument, oh, they were worshipping a deity that they uh, sacrificed some of their children to. So Yahweh got angry because they were sacrificing some of their children, so he goes down and slaughters all of their children as a punishment. Again, yeah. not a very good explanation. But do, do you believe I mean, that was uh, written down wrong, or or is this not, or was it actually happening? Yeah, he, here's here's what I'm stuck with. I'm stuck hmm. with a person that came in the flesh, said, this is God, and I'm telling you to love your enemies. The prostitute was thrown at his feet, and he said, I don't condemn Shiny, you happy anymore. Jesus. Shiny, happy Jesus, but a Jesus <laughs> that everything revolved around love and loving your enemies. So, yeah. Except when for the part that, that didn't. I, what's that? Except for the parts that didn't, you know, with Except the sword. Except for the and part that you division. say that you know exactly what he means when you didn't even know that the word hell was translated as Gehenna. So, I just, I, I mean, yeah. sure, the parts yeah, that yeah. I don't like, but I've also heard really good explanation. I mean, the, for me, the driving narrative of the Bible is, is mm. coming from Jesus when he said, hey, I've, I've come to set the captives free. These and tiny little pieces now, of the Bible. These tiny from little now parts. On, I, I mean, not tiny little parts. He basically said all of the law can be wrapped up into love others as you love yourself, love God. So, I mean, that it's not a tiny little piece. That's the overriding general theme of the whole thing. I don't see how that's a, a tiny piece. Well, and so, yeah, for me, I'm, I'm put, I'm, I'm stuck with the choice of, am I going to be a very fundamental uh, Christian that has kind of taken God's word and, and made it what my logical brain makes it? Or I'm, am I going to start with Jesus who preached unbelievably radical love and actually showed that as well and let that dictate everything else that I believe about the Bible. So I would say, and a lot of my Christian brothers and sisters will totally tune me out after I say this, but I will say that I, I don't, I'm not positive that God, the creator, I, I don't know what I feel about the wrath of God. Like, I don't know. I, I just right. think that there is there's so much stuff recorded, mm -hmm. and we were taught to read the Bible a certain way, and there's a lot of very informed, studied Christians that are saying, look, you're being irresponsible with this thing. Like, understand the culture, understand what's going on. Um, and so I, it's, you know, it makes it sound like I'm just, going back and forth and picking and choosing what I'm, what I'm saying is exactly. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not smart enough to remember all the things that I have read, but there's some very le legit substantiation to a lot of the stuff that I'm saying as far as not just reading some of that stuff at, at face value. I mean, but I, but I certainly don't see there, there are certain things in the Bible where I don't see how you could take any other way. I mean, Jesus either said to love your enemies or not. Yeah, he said to follow the laws or not. I mean, there's there's places in there he says to follow the law, and then there's that place where he says the only one law. So, I mean, it, 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 in, at best, it's contradictory, and you have to pick and choose which ones you want to follow. So that leaves us back at the beginning and out of time. So... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I do appreciate the crap out of you coming on, man, uh, and yeah, man, all your answers. Fun. So, thanks it for fun, thanks man. for round two. <laughs> One of these days, you're gonna accept that uh, purple dragon that I worship. Oh, is it, okay. is it a dragon? You call it a dragon? <laughs> it's an invisible dinosaur deity. Dinosaur, dinosaur. I messed that one up. <laughs> all right, man. No well, way. thanks for your time too. It's always a fun conversation. Absolutely. Thanks, man. Talk to you later. Bye.